Welcome to the Warships Podcast with your host, Kellorn, Venicera, and Aaron. Hello and welcome to episode 120 of the Warships Podcast. The seas have been smoothing over some over the last week of World of Warships, and I am your host, Kellorn, and Venicera and Arun are here with me today as we do a little podcast sailing. Uh, we start out with some exciting news, as I've been invited by Wargaming to attend the event on USS Texas in a few weeks on March 2nd in Houston, Texas. If you're nearby and want to come out and to see Wargaming, USS Texas, and me, uh, check out the forum post from Femininity, which we will actually link in the, the podcast description. Uh, and, and I ordered more podcast stickers, so be sure to ask me if, uh, for a, a sticker if you see me on uh, Texas. And if you have any questions or whatnot, I'm happy to uh, – I actually have a little segment with uh, Sea Raptor as we were the two CCs that we'll be attending. I will say it's a little mildly terrifying to be a little part of the official event schedule, but I am looking forward to having a good time and, and meeting some of you guys uh, on USS Texas. Uh, that said, I'm excited about the uh, the idea of uh, local events and having get-togethers for World Warships. How valuable do you guys think that events like these are for the health of the game uh, and the player base as a whole? Well, I know you know the past events that I've been to have, have been pretty good, and I think you know it. It's not like the entire community gets to go, but for those people who do, um, you do, you know, get to meet some really cool people and, you know, you, you know, you can establish, you know, online contacts. And then when you go back and play the game, you know, you actually have a face to put with the person you're playing and, and can make some more friends, uh, playing this game. So I, I, I think it is really valuable as, especially in the fact that, you know, oftentimes Wargaming will, will show you some cool things that, you know, that they're, you know, either coming along or about to bring out with the game. Um, and, you know, just the fact that when you go to one of these events, you actually see how much Wargaming actually really does care about their product and about their community. And you just, you get that when you're there in person. Define local. Well, Local is a bit of a slippery subject for you, Arun. But I guess yes. you know. I know you went to the 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 CC Summit, but have you been to any other kind of wargaming or events or any like game events in general? And how did they affect your perception of the game? Um, I have only been to wargaming events. I've been to Warsaw and Moscow. Um, I liked both of them. Um, they were great, and I loved the fact that I got to meet people behind it, especially. Uh, well, the Moscow event was mostly with the tanks guys, and it was great meeting them, you know, because we're still talking about doing similar things. And uh, I thought it was amazing, to be honest. And these, I, I think these kinds of events are great because they just bind the community together. Um, I'm not even so sure how important they would be for, well, really CCs. I think it's more for the actual players themselves because the people who show up at events like that, I think they're far more invested in the game afterwards than they were before. And I think that's a really cool thing and obviously useful. I also think that it's cool that they will often give out some really cool swag and goodies and sometimes in-game items, you know, uh, at the the Lexington event, you know, the CCs were given alabamas and stuff to hand out to people the codes for them on these little cards so i mean you definitely got some cool stuff uh if if you made it make it to the event so we've seen our second hot fix in as many weeks as part of the cv rework namely wargaming states that they fixed the bug resulting in huge damage spikes from aa explosions i'm assuming that means flak at tier eight and it adjusted the aa the damage progression on all aa explosions on all tiers They've resolved some issues with the continuous DPS calculation and made some balance changes to some of the test ships, which will uh, the test ships we'll get into in just a minute. But Arun, how have these changes affected carrier play at the higher tiers since the 0.8.0.2 uh, pot fix? So if I had a really nice laugh, like the guy from CinemaSins, uh, when you mentioned the anti-air damage spikes, I would have liked to laugh at that point because, yes, it, they're not wrong. They did l limit the damage spike, but if you're a tier 8 CV in a tier 10 game, that damage spike is still enough to basically instantly kill your planes. Uh, they're just gone, just wiped off the map. Uh, Especially Kaga. 
Especially Kaga. I don't... I guess, yes, especially Kaga, but honestly, it's all the same on all of them. Uh, yesterday, for example, I was in a game with um, where I was uh, one of four tier eight chips. Everything else was tier 10, not nine, 10. And um, I was doing an attack on uh, Montana. And there was this Minotaur that was like five, six, six-ish kilometers away. And uh, I didn't get to drop once. Uh, all of my planes died before they got within three kilometers of the Montana. So that wasn't quite nice. And it's not like I... I don't think I deliberately flew into like a flat cloud or anything like that. And they just went poof and that was it. And I was, a, I was a Graf Zeppelin as well at the time. And they have incredibly fast planes. So yeah, I don't know. This... Toning down stuff, yes, it works great against tier 10s. Tier 10 CVs definitely feel that the situation is better. But tier 8s in a tier 10 game? No, absolutely not. Just no way. The The anti-air change just does not feel strong enough. And on the other hand, though, I don't know if they should change it further. Because I I like the way the anti-air works right now. The All of the anti-air isn't tied up into the flak bubble now. So you have the... Conti- Continuous damage is still is now a significant part of the damage on most ships, but I think destroyer AA might still need some changes. So one of the things that when we first tested the the CV rework back uh, at the CC summit, Arun, you know they had those little like circles that uh, because they didn't have the flat clouds yet, and you know we talked about a little bit, and one of the the suggestions that I put into my feedback was that you know, sometimes it was really, really easy to just avoid all of the flack and that they were going to have to be careful, you know, not to make it so that you could literally make a uh, medium and long range AA just not matter on ships. And I feel like they, you know, either took that advice from a, a bunch of us and just went ridiculously off the other end or, but like, I just feel like now you can't avoid it. Like it, you're going to hit some flat clouds, even if you do the absolutely crazy flying, particularly when you have some of the larger squadrons, things like Kaga, where, you know, you have just a ton of planes and, you know, you hit a flat cloud and they're all going to die, but you can't like avoid them either. I actually feel that you can avoid flat clouds almost all of the time, except when you're actually doing an, an attack. And the problem with it is that, um, uh, when you're doing an attack, you need to fly in a straight line. Sometimes you just your planes aren't maneuverable enough anymore to even do anything about that. But one thing I did find is that um, flak seems to be it seems to go you know fire in pulses. It'll fire, then there's like a little lull, then it fires again, and if you use the slowing down with the S key and then speed speed up again with the W key. You can quite often simply fly in a straight line and the flak, you know, basically through the flak clouds, except you don't take any damage from the flak clouds themselves. So that's a possibility now to avoid flak as well. I think as players get better, we'll find more ways on how to avoid flak, uh, you know. Maybe at some point, Wargaming needs to actually make it more difficult to avoid. We're not there yet. Yeah, there's still some balancing that needs to happen. You know, and one of the big things, Vanessa, is that we've seen a lot of them, people talking about the excessive spotting ability of destroyers by the new uh, by the new carrier in this carriers in the CV rework. You know, on one level, I get what they're talking about. Um, but on the other level, it's still only one squadron that's spotting you instead of having, you know, like Haku, you had how many squadrons? you know, eight in the air or whatever it was, uh, you know, in the the previous iteration of the CVs. So I feel like it's a double-edged sword, but at the same time, I also feel like it's people, um, you know, feeling their way into a new meta. uh, And, and there are a lot of just growing pains with that. Do you think it's a fun, I guess my question for you is, do you think that the CV rework spotting needs to be addressed? And is it a fundamental problem with the, the CV rework, or is it something that people just need to adjust to? Well, I think it's a little bit of everything. And one thing that I think people kind of forget is with the old CV structure, there were fighters. And oftentimes, 
you know, you would have fighter groups, you know, over the caps or in the middle of the map kind of doing this ballet, if you will, back and forth as, you know, you're kind of scouting, but also kind of preventing the your opposing carrier from coming over onto your side of the map and, and you're just kind of reading the battle. Yeah, oftentimes you would be spotted as a destroyer with that but they wouldn't necessarily park planes over your destroyer because they're flying back and forth and you know you wouldn't want your fighter groups or or the carrier you know they don't want their planes to be lost immediately to a strafe that they weren't paying attention to so yes in the early stages of a match you know you you might be spotted but even if you were spotted if you kept your aa off you know, the carrier had more pressing things than to necessarily keep you spotted the entire time. And I think that in its in of itself kind of played a different role than what we're seeing now. Now, you know, carriers do not have controllable fighter groups. I mean, yeah, you could deploy it, but I've still yet to see those fighter groups actually do anything other than Oh, I'm I'm not gonna fly there. I don't see them actually respond um and legitimately shoot down planes. Furthermore, those deployable fighter groups, you know, they don't go really far. They don't, you know, they're not gonna follow your destroyer or follow, you know, any ship that you've deployed it on. So, you know, it's it's a little bit different. You know, you could in the old system you could take a fighter group and actually escort a ship. And have them, you know, circle around that ship wherever that goes that, you know, it's there until they run out of ammo. You know, it to answer the second part of the question, yes, it is going to take some a, a bit of an adjustment and maybe a shift in meta. Right now, if you try and go and go towards the objectives, you know, the carrier can kind of have free reign as they, you know, strafe you or, or do multiple attack runs. And, you know, they can really focus you even if your friendly carrier comes along and deploys a fighter group you know it it's not a huge area for you um to to work with or maneuver with so it's just it's different you know i think a lot of us remember you know having planes parked over us but i feel like that was always at the end of the match when the other carrier was dead or your carrier, your team's carrier was dead. And, you know, your opposing carrier, you know, doesn't have anything else to do with those, with those fighter groups. So they're going to keep you spotted. So I don't quite agree with, um, well, I, 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 I don't quite agree with the fact that um, even back in the day, uh, we didn't have as much CB spotting. I think it didn't happen because of convenience. Um, this this CV spotting issue of destroyers was an issue even with the uh, even back in closed beta with RTS CVs, uh, because back then we didn't have fighter strafing, meaning that fighters would only get to click fight, and so they would be much more idle quite more often, because you know sometimes it would simply be better to spot the DDs instead of trying to chase the planes down. And one thing is that people often just didn't want to use their planes on, uh, well, perma spotting a destroyer because they don't get rewarded for it. But you do get rewarded for you do get rewarded for it now, not because you're trying to spot the destroyer so that others can shoot it, but because in the natural way you play the game while you're trying to attack the destroyer, you keep the destroyer spotted for a long time. Whereas in the past with RTS CVs, if you were attacking that destroyer, you would spot her for, I don't know, 30 seconds, you would do your drop, and then you would go away to recharge the planes to come back again and drop again, you know, and this would be the way you would be encouraged to play. But you're not, in, but you are not encouraged to play like this now because, you know, you need to do multiple attacks and during all of that time, the destroyer is spotted. So this is a new... This is a much this is a bigger issue now, but the issue was there the entire time. In my opinion, this is an issue that should have been dealt with even back in closed beta, but well, unfortunately not. But I do really hope that Wargaming does something about that. 
I do think that we are going to see some kind of change. I mean, we've, we've seen, heard some rumbles about uh, things that are, that may be coming down the pipe in terms of the DD spotting. My issue really is that I struggle to see how they can improve the DD spotting of with airplanes without, you know, I mean, there's the obvious there's, you know, get rid of the, the RPF from planes that that's, that's a no brainer. I think that, you know, there, that, that one just needs to be done and be over with, and we don't need to talk about that anymore. But I mean, uh, but from there, you know, DDs already have, uh, you know, some of the DDs already have absurdly small spotting ranges. Do you make them even smaller? Do you not give the ability of planes, their planes, the ability to spot DDs at all? I mean, that doesn't make any sense because the, you know, DDs are important targets. So I, I think that we're, we're looking at, we're looking at some really careful balancing that needs to happen. Otherwise you can seriously break the game by making a change. Somebody had a suggestion that I read about uh, that planes don't, at least carrier launched planes, don't spot for anything for a firing solution, but they have an ability they can use which uh, will basically, you know, allow anything they spot to be shot at for some duration of time. So it would basically work like radar, except the plane would have to be there as well. Well, that or, you know, if there's no ship in range that, you know, could communicate kind of like how, um, I don't want to say the, the radioing does in World of Tanks, but, you know, kind of the similar concept, if there's nothing in range, then you know, it only appears on the minimap or, you know, some variation of that, like planes can only show that, the, hey, the, the, there is a destroyer here on the minimap, but no one can necessarily shoot at it. And the carrier can still attack the destroyer, but everyone else wouldn't necessarily be able to shoot at it unless they're like really close in range. We also have the radar rework coming too that they've talked about in Maybe you could do some type of similar system with that. Yeah, I mean, we are going to talk a little bit more about our further impressions about the uh, the, uh, the radar and uh, and whatnot later on. So we'll sa- we'll save that for then. Arun, did you have any final thoughts to talk about the hot fix and and what we might see? Do you? Th- do, I guess do you expect another hot fix before we see zero point eight point one? I don't know. I don't think it's necessary to have a hot fix, but. At least I don't, I don't think it would be likely to have a hotfix for CV stuff anyway. Um, but I mean, I definitely think the next patch is going to still bring some more CV changes that are probably going to change things quite a bit again. So one thing I did want to talk about before we move on is that I've been seeing some games that end in two CVs facing off against two CVs with all the other ships in the match dead. I feel like this is a really unhealthy result for the game. And I guess, is this an argument for single carrier matches? And what do you guys think are the root causes of these occurrences? Is it because more and more people are playing CVs? I mean, why are we ending up with CV on CV at the end of some matches? Because CVs don't die. I mean, it depends on what the CVs do. Uh, Usually CVs sit far back. And so, yes, they aren't as effective as a result of it. But on the other hand, it also means that they're basically not going to die until the game gets, well, when there's no other target left, because CVs are very good anti-air. Tier 10 CVs are basically impervious to everything except torpedo bombers. So for a CV to snipe another CV is kind of difficult. And this just means that all the other ships are much more likely to die before the CV does, even the crazy anti-air ships. On the other hand, I haven't actually found that games... I don't think I've been in any games that have been two CVs versus two CVs at the end or some variation of that. Usually it's one side still has a ship or two left and the other side doesn't have any. And the interesting thing at that point is that if one side has a surface ship like a battleship left, then the then that side CVs tend to be very generous with their fighter planes because for some reason usually they still have quite many of them left and they'll just fly near the battleship and drop them on top of that because a battleship has a much easier time on deleting the enemy CV than well the actual CVs themselves. Vanessa, have you seen any CV on CV matches at the end? Uh, yeah, I've experienced a couple of them. I mean it. it... Sometimes, well, I mean, you know, I'm I'm trying to remember back in the day, but, you know, even 
relatively recently, you would often still have carrier v carrier at the at the end of the match. So, I mean, I don't think it's that much different than it was before. But yeah, I, ha- I have seen it a lot. I, I guess. Do you find that to be unhealthy for the game? Do you do you do you see it as a, a as a direct result of the rework, or what do you think is happening that is causing that? Honestly, I I don't know. Other than you know maybe the carriers, you know they just there's closer targets between them and the other carrier. Um, I I I honestly I I just don't know, and I don't know. I I really just don't know. I I don't have an answer for you on that. Oh, well, something to to consider for next time, but. So, so we've seen some significant changes to the test ships, Viribus, Inuitus, Exeter, Yahagi, and Nustashimi. First up, Viribus has had her Sigma nerfed from, zero, from 1.8 to 1.65. Her ability to repair casemate damage was increased to 50%, from 50% to 40%, uh, but her Citadel repair potential increased from 10% to 33%. So, so this is a pretty interesting gimmick for a low tier battleship, and it's really quite unprecedented among battleships that we've seen in the game thus far. Now, I will say that I played a few matches with Virabus, and honestly, I found her to be still to be in a really good spot uh, in terms of you know ability to do damage and ability to absorb damage. Her really one weakness that I found is that she has a really low HP total for a tier five battleship of like thirty three thousand. Uh, so when you see some of these other battleships in the in you know Texas at tier five can have fifty thousand or or what you know things like that, you know it does feel a little bit like you need to play well and angle well and take your damage well because you can't just fight other people hit points for hit points. My experience, it does not take damage. It, honestly, I I'm impressed that you've had really good results with this ship. Um, I've had some games where I did okay damage and some i think one or two where i had really really good damage but you cannot take a hit in the ship it is a glass cannon in my experience so you you basically you don't have hit points to take damage you you really just take damage when people are shooting at you so you really have to kind of use your concealment it does have decent concealment but i mean it's a slow battleship you you know you kind of have to find a place kind of make like a hole in the water and then do your damage and then hope that people start don't start focusing you because the ship just cannot take a hit it just i i got citadeled regardless of angle just absolutely taking massive damage with it I will say one of its redeeming qualities, Vanessa, yes, it's absolutely slow as hell, but it has a tiny little turning circle. Like you can turn around in in basically a couple of ship lengths. Yeah, well, when you're not, you know, going Mach 2, yeah, you can easily turn on a diamond. Did you check out the Virabus at all, uh, Arun, or was it just not really to your, t- cup, to your liking? I did, and my... She doesn't feel like a tier 5 battleship, is how I feel about it. Yes, she can fight tier 5 battleships, There's no or tier 5 ships in general. She can there's, fight tier 6s too. Yeah, I mean, there's no real question about that in my experience. But the problem is that um, she doesn't feel like a tier 5 ship because of how insanely slow she is. And the problem is that it's fine at tier 4 because all of the maps are small. But when you're in a tier 5 to tier 7 bracket, you suddenly can end up on maps that are much bigger and your slowness becomes, uh, in my opinion, a pretty big disadvantage because you then need to position yourself in a way where uh, it's possible for you to go from one objective to another, which means you can't go to, well, I don't quite mean map borders, but on the sides. So you try to be somewhere more towards the middle but this also means that you're going to be shot at much more often and well she isn't great at being shot at well one of the things that i i kind of feel like she plays like you know west virginia or she plays like uh colorado at tier seven you know they, she is absolutely slower than a lot most of the ships that she's going to meet so you just kind of have to account for that um, and you know, like I, I still found her to be acceptable, uh, when I, I, you know, I, I did what I normally do with battleships. I find, uh, uh, one, uh, side 
and I kind of own that side and then move on from there. Yeah, you don't win every game doing that, but it certainly it keeps you alive more than trying to be somewhere in the middle with it. But those two ships can take a hit. This one can't. It, on a, I'll just say this. If this if this ship comes out now to purchase, I am not recommending it for people cuz it is a glass cannon. Yeah, you've you've got some guns that sometimes feel satisfactory, but honestly, it it doesn't bring anything that I feel really appeals to players. I don't know. I I guess I liked her a little more, but like uh, yeah, than than you guys did, but uh I I found her to be acceptable. I don't think she's good, but she's acceptable. Definitely not when you're seeing tier sevens, though. Like, you might as well forget it. Oh, no, now that I agree with. I mean, but I mean, a lot of these low tier premiums have trouble when they're up tier, when they're double up tiered. But I guess the question is, you know, they made her tier, tier five. Would you recommend that they reverse that and go back to tier four? Because I really don't recommend that. I, I did not feel like she was a good fit at tier four either because she did things that just you did not want to see her at tier four. She would just own everything. I don't think she was as overpowered as Nikolai, but it certainly was better than any any of the in-tier researchable ships at tier four. Wait, really? Isn't the Orion the best tier four battleship? As in better than Nikolai? I, I don't know. Like, it may, you know, I, Orion got a pretty significant nerf, but, you know, well, I guess, no, she didn't. Only the Iron Duke got the nerf, didn't she? Well... Her Ichi is still pr pretty good. Her downside is speed. That's why I prefer the Ishizuchi when I'm uh, trying to seal club. Yeah, I just, I feel there's other things that you could probably address with the ship. I mean, you could probably really nerf the Sigma on the guns. And maybe, you know, adjust some of the AP penetration or damage. Uh, but my God, having it at tier five, I don't feel this is a tier five battleship. The fact that you are going to see more often than not tier sixes and tier sevens and you have cruisers that are outranging you and you don't have the speed to necessarily track them down or, you know, keep up with it. Just I honestly, I, I feel like the ship is garbage at tier five. It's a glass cannon. And as soon as people start shooting at you, you're done. I do feel like they, they, they could safely give her about 5,000, maybe even 8,000 more hit points. I think that um, Wargaming might want to consider making her limited in matchmaking so that she doesn't get put into Tier 7 games. Perhaps that would make her okay at Tier 5. But I, ha but I agree with you that I don't think she... She would have to get two substantial nerfs uh, when you down-tier her to Tier 4 again to... I think she would basically lose her identity. Yeah, I, I we'll see what happens, but I, I don't think that we've seen the end of the the adjustments for Viribus. So, uh, but that takes us to our next ship. Um, so Exeter got the nerf that we all expected that she would get, but the nerf nerf hammer was more like a sledgehammer in my opinion because they nerfed her main battery reload, the which was increased from twelve to fifteen seconds, and her smoke generator was removed. So being fair, Exeter in her original test form was stupidly overpowered. Let's not mince words about that. I, I, you could cackle all day long with the things that she could do. But I feel like either one of these nerfs probably would have been enough to bring her into line. And the, and the fact that they're reaching for both of them, in my opinion, is excessive. Yeah, you'll get no disagreement out of me trying to uh, play the ship now with without a smoke generator. It Again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's it's a British cruiser. It it cannot take a hit, and yeah, you've you've got the ability to haul heal, but it it's not like the light cruisers. And uh, you like yeah, I I had some decent games testing this new iteration, but decent on like the low end, not like comfortable that i would be like oh i'm really enjoying the ship but it's still not overpowered like i'm enjoying the ship and i really worked for you know the victory or worked for what i did and i'm not really feeling that in in the new exeter Aaron, i know that you were never as big of a fan of exeter as vanessa and i were did you think that it was a nerf was warranted at all because you kind of felt like it wasn't a very good ship as i recall well ship 
she felt fine. I just was never in a situation where her strengths materialized for me. Uh, I just probably didn't play enough games, and that's why. Uh, but looking at the nerfs, I think they're too much. You know, it makes you wonder, why am I playing this ship instead of, well, the Furutaka, which is basically does the same thing, except she can take a million hits, even from battleships. Just makes well, you wonder. Well, I mean, the Furutaka has lots of armor, yep. and this thing does not. Yeah, and they basically do the same thing. Yeah, I, I, I would prefer the armor of the Furutaka over the hull heel of the Exeter any day of the week. So I feel like you need to give the Exeter some kind of identity. I mean, I, I you know, the, the 12 second reload on the guns was excessive. I mean, everybody kind of knew that even when we first looking at looked at the stats. I don't even know why they tried that in the beginning. But, you know, I would have rather they take away the hull heel and left the smoke generator because it just right now it just does not feel good. Yeah, I'd almost rather have and play Yahagi um over this iteration of it because like you're not the sonar you're you barely going to ever get into a use of trying to use it in my opinion at that tier and yeah if you you know trying to use it just to you know ward off torpedoes i mean a lot of destroyers at the tier have ridiculously low concealments so i mean i can well i mean i guess i can see some use there but i just you know it had some utility before it had some abilities to you know kind of in in a way i mean we kind of see well this is why you know we didn't get he spamming cruisers in the first place with smoke i totally get that but i mean that like you're not gonna you can't take a hit in the ship so you know trying to heal back you know what an eighth of the damage it seems like like you'll you'll take a massive hit i'm like okay trying to and then you just kind of you know kind of work your way around try to not get deleted while you might be able to get some more health back and you know you oh yeah you've got heavy cruiser guns but i mean it's pretty slow i just i, I don't know it's just not an enjoyable ship In tr uh so we have two other changed ships uh which were yahagi which really got only a, a very small change, which had her reload speed re reduced from 10 to 9 seconds, and Nustrashimi, which had her repair party buff from 50% to 60% damage restoration, a 20 from 28, 20 to 28 second duration, and 2% HP per second instead of 0.5% HP per second. This repair party is the equivalent of a British light cruiser and will basically turn the Russian DD into a zombie regenerating machine. I feel like the Yohagi buff was probably warranted. Make that ship a little better. Make her, uh, you know, more, you know, give her an identity uh, that's distinct from Aoba and Furutaka. But this Nutris Shime buff is insane. Like, I did not find her to be struggling so much that she needed this. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that maybe they would shave a second off on the reload time of the, you know, the main battery to you know have it around two seconds and you know because aren't those guns a guns anyway or i mean i, d I don't know what guns, the, yeah yeah and I, I don't know what this real life reload was but um you know I, I think i would i'd rather see you know a really fast rate of fire with those guns than necessarily you know the zombie build if you will i the i mean you can kind of go in and it's like, oh, okay, well, um, yeah, I'll take some damage. I don't care. And <laughs> you just kind of like fight a little bit and and just kind of retreat and and repair, and then come back and fight some more and retreat and repair. And it's an interesting destroyer. It it definitely it's it's definitely usable now, but I I feel that. Maybe instead of doing that, if you just increase the reload rate with the guns, it I think it would be really enjoyable. I think that Didi needed something like that because, in my opinion, all she basically had was uh, anti-air because her... Yes, she had guns, she had torpedoes, all of those things, but none of them were very good. Uh, if you looked at the guns, she would get outgunned fought by a Shimakaze. I mean... 
it's I, I guess if you take so Arun, you are okay with the fact that she will be able to regenerate fifty six percent of her hit points in one heal. Fifty six percent. I guess because it's two percent per second for twenty eight seconds. Actually, I guess I would have one condi- I would put one condition on that. I would make her take full penetration damage from AP from battleships because. If everything she gets hit by is light damage, then she gets to always heal everything back, and that's obviously a problem. So, yeah, that, that that's a bit too ridiculous now that I think about it some more. Um, still, though, I, I do think she needed something drastic because, yes, you could absolutely play her fine, but you can also play Shimakas as a gunboat, but it's not exactly very effective, right? And that's why I think she needed something. I, I don't disagree that she needed something, Arun. I, I, I really don't. I She was not in a great spot. But I, I don't like... I, I have a hard enough time with things like Conqueror and the you know, Neptune and, and Minotaur and how much HP they get back with their heals. Giving it to this in something that literally can disappear... I mean, this has one of the lowest concealment in the game. I mean, it's the equivalent of a Shimakaze. It can disengage whenever it wants to go back and get all of its hit points back. Like I, I do that. That is going to be a nightmare to deal with. So it's like a conqueror. Yeah, basically it's, it's a destroyer conqueror with decent torpedoes. I, I don't know. I, I think I, I like your suggestion about full pen damage. I, I think that that would be a way to offset what they're doing here and still make for interesting gameplay. I mean, basically you're never going to repair a fire or a, a flood unless it's going to kill you on uh on this thing you're never going to dcp it because you want to be able to have that damage to repair so i you know i think that it would make for interesting gameplay but i also think it makes her too strong i think you need to do something to dial back and but i really do like the idea of full battleship pen damage on her because that really gives people battleships an incentive to shoot at her over other things hey maybe we could give this heal to a habarovsk too could be fun right how many people do you want to, to, you know, quit the game? But speaking of, of, of people quitting the game, there's been a lot of talk going around about the fact that people that that the number of people playing the game is down. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation about it. But from what I understand, the, from the people that I've, uh, that I've talked to at Wargaming, the numbers since the CV rework are actually up in terms of people playing the game. So, uh, you know, th- I don't think that that has been communicated terribly well, but does it surprise you guys that the number of people playing the game has increased? No, because you have basically a new and interesting toy uh, with the CV rework to try and play. So, yeah, I, I would say in the interim right now, the numbers are definitely going to be up because there's a whole massive amount of new things. I feel the same way. Uh, it it definitely would surprise me if the numbers were down because I just don't see why they would be down from my experience they have se- they have seemed to be up but i haven't paid too much attention to how many players are online um but yeah i don't really see why they would be down i guess that was more of a way of uh, of letting people know hey don't listen to the people that are doom and glooming saying that th- things are poor but the dev blog opened up this week about the distribution methods for three ships that are in the coming soon stage Azuma, which we talked about last week, will be tier 9 and available for free XP. Yoshino, which is the first time we've heard the name of the tier 10 modernized Azuma uh, that will have torpedoes, will be available for coal. And Nustrashimi will be a tier 9 sold for steel. I'll be the first to admit I was wrong last week when I guessed that Yoshino would be sold for steel. But honestly, I think that I'm happy about this. So Yoshino sold for coal will open her up to a larger audience and Nustrashimi sold for steel makes her unlikely to affect clan battles and give you kind of a toy for participating in competitive modes when you earn steel, but not have that toy upsetting the balance of, you know, most of the competitive modes. So I guess, did this surprise you guys that that, that you get this distribution of, of, uh, of methods? No, not really. It definitely surprised me, and I'm very happy for it. Although now that now that I I think about that one, could we walk back on the Nustrashimi stuff? We should nerf her, I think. Uh, where, why is that? Well, I mean, she's available for steel, right? So 
it'll be more difficult for me to get one. So obviously, uh, I want her to be non-existent. Ah, I see. Uh, what's the word for that, Aaron? I mean, like, uh, conflict of interest, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that the I was really worried about Yoshino being sold for steel and it becoming, a, you know, another version of Stalingrad, which, you know, as much as I love my Stalingrad, as much as I enjoyed the, the earning her, I'm not going to sit here and say that it wasn't controversial that only certain people were able to play her. And honestly, I feel like Salem has been a good influence on the game of, of a tier time being sold for coal. And that, you know, people are able to get her. She may not be the greatest tier 10. She has some significant downsides, but there's still a T10 that you can earn and use in a clan battle that you can earn for Cole. I wish the Salem had the same legendary upgrade as the Demine does. Like maybe they could share it or something, or maybe there should be one. That would be actually be really Because cool. the reason I don't want to play the Salem over the Demine is the fact that I can take the legendary on the Demine and it feels so much better. Yeah, the, the legendary on the Des Moines is is really really crazy. I I do I do like that. But at any rate, a new method of clan participation is coming called Naval Battles Clan Competition. From Monday to Thursday every week, clan members will, members will complete tasks to allow them to enter the competition during the weekend. From Friday to Sunday, clans will attempt to earn more stars than other clans by completing tasks on certain ships. I'm not exactly clear on how well this is going to work. The the uh, There's an uh, an article on the web portal that you can read, and maybe you guys can figure it out a little more than I can, but I, I'm still a little unclear how this is going to work. Honestly, uh, participants can opt in or out of the weekend engagement, but only get 10 attempts per weekend. Honestly, this was something out of left field for me, and it feels more like a way for clans to earn resources than truly compete with against each other, as I really don't see anything in the article about how you know winning against other clans or competing against other clans gets you rewards so i know that you guys have had some issues with clan stuff in the past does this get you excited in any way or is this just kind of something oh it's a way that we can earn some resources for our clan yeah it just seems like something that you can do to earn resources for your clan i mean without you know obviously we'll see it as it starts to come out more and we get more information on it um, but it kind of reminds me of the planetary conquest in uh, SWOTOR, so, or at least the concept of it. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it it definitely does seem like, well, here's a time sink for you to do throughout the week, and then your payoff is on the weekend. But if, again, if you have a schedule where, you know, maybe you don't really play much during the week and it can only play on the weekends, or you can't really play on the weekends then again it's not going to be really appealing i don't know it doesn't really i don't feel strongly about it i guess it's nice that they're adding stuff to clan stuff which isn't really this doesn't feel forced in some way like they're trying to get people to try this thing out really hard so feels okay to me i think it's i think it's a good addition to the game because it's just more content I, I do agree that more content is generally good. I, I'm kind of reserving judgment in some way because as much as they wrote in the article, I still feel way in the dark about how it actually works. So, you know, hopefully they put out a video or something and something to show us how it works or let us play with it on the test server. Because right now I just I don't quite I'm not quite there yet. So so radar and flooding are coming changing in the upcoming patch. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's 0.8.1. Uh, and I'd like to revisit this a bit. Or is it 0 0.8.1 or 0 0.8.2, guys? I, hold on. 8.1 should be at least because we're on 8.0.2 right now. Yes, uh, it is changing in 0 0.8.1. It's better. Sorry, guys. It was it was wrong in my notes, and that's not good. So I, I would like to revisit this for a bit to get you guys' opinion on how the changes in radar and flooding will affect the game now that we've been living with the reworked CVs for a couple of weeks. Is this some these Are these changes that we've talked about pretty extensively uh, a couple weeks ago are do have your opinions changed on them at all or do you think that they're exactly what we expected i i kind of already i can live with it is basically my opinion but i don't think i still think that it's not very good that we're buffing uh radar like this while basically nerfing flooding for destroyers at the same time 
On the other hand, I do think flooding changes need to happen, or at least flooding changes would need to happen to CVs because uh, CV flooding is just obnoxious. The damage it can output is, uh, I don't know, you, you can just add like plus 30 to plus 40% to your damage output in a game if you get some good floodings off. I guess, you know, I just have to do a wait and see and and see how things change with, you know, ever really just everything involved and, you know, the continued balancing and rebalancing with the carriers as well. I, I'm a little unsure about how the radar is going to affect thing, things. In my first look at it, I think that the radar's changes are actually probably going to be a help to DDs for the most part. Um, I, I do think that um, the people that are saying this, the new methods of the of radar are that are going to completely make destroyers unviable. I think that's an extreme overreaction. I, I do think that they will end up being positive for the game. But honestly, the more interesting thing for me is flooding. Uh, flooding is something that has been a part of the game that has been you kind of it's a trump. It's always been a trump card in some way. Uh, you know the. If you get flooded in a battleship and your DCP isn't up, you're in real trouble. So we've taught ourselves to play the game. How many times have people said, don't heal one fire? And the reason that you don't heal one fire is because if you get a flooding after that, you've repaired that fire, you're hosed. So these new floodings are much less dangerous than the old floodings were. It's much more viable to say you can let that flood. Uh, And it's going to change things for the carriers, which I think is a positive thing. So the you know carrier flooding was way out of control, and I agree with everyone on that, particularly with the way that the rework works. Um, it's going to change things for destroyers, and in uh, but I think that the change for destroyers is going to be far more limited. You know, how many times have you seen a destroyer kill somebody with flooding damage? How many times have you seen a destroyer kill somebody with alpha damage from hitting them with a bunch of torps? I, I really feel like destroyers don't rely on flooding to do their damage. Uh, so the people that are crying that this is a nerf to destroyers, I think that's a little hypocritical. Uh, but at the same time, I think that it's a real boon for battleships and it gives you more options. You know, if you repair that fire, you know, then get hit by, by torpedoes, it's not as big a deal. So I think that's going to make things like battleships a little easier to play which may or may not be a good thing for the game. I don't know. But I do think that it's going to be a little bit more viable for battleships to push up into places where they know that there are destroyers that have torpedoes because the the, the flooding is not the end-all, be-all, you're screwed that it used to be. I think it depends on the, stro- de- on the destroyer. Uh, there's some... Some destroyers and destroyer lines, you know, the German destroyers don't have that high of an alpha torpedo damage, but particularly one that I can think of is the Sims. Um, I know they put in the the dev notes that the, you know, will possibly be uh, buffing the damage output of the torpedoes, but I know when I played the Sims, I've actually kind of hoped for flooding because you're you're really not going to do that much damage with the sea mines per se, but it's that flooding, the damage over time is 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 where you get your damage in. So I feel, I feel like there's a couple examples that you know this it really does apply you know to these particular ships, but as a whole, um, I I agree with you. It, it's most destroyers, you know, you're you're getting you know, your damage hits in, you know, with one or two torpedoes, you rarely have, you know, are you seeing people get dev struck uh, by waves of torpedoes? And, you know, you, you generally don't see too many flood outs. I mean, they do happen. And but I mean, most people, like you've said, have just been so programmed to hold on to that DCP that you know, you just wait up. Oh, there's the torpedoes. Okay, am I going to get flooded or not? Flooded. All right, repair. I think that while destroyers might not rely on uh, flooding, uh, there is a. It's a. It's an effective weapon when you that you can use. Uh, I think this is one reason why the Shimakaza is a lot better than many of the other destroyers because she gets three sets of torpedoes, so you could drop two sets of torpedoes. You know, to catch a wide area. And if they hit, you could launch you could launch a second set that's like twenty five seconds behind. If they get flooded and they use it immediately and then get hit again and get flooded again, 
they're basically screwed. That's a huge risk that people take against the Shumakaze uh, or well any other destroyer that uh, you know doesn't launch all of their torpedoes at once. Now, this isn't very common to happen because often people will simply dodge the second set of torpedoes that comes because they'll, you know, they'll, they they can count a little bit. You know, counting to three isn't very difficult. Uh, but I think it does. Technically, you got to count to 15, but. Okay, okay, okay. fine, fine. I, well, I guess it could also be 16. Some ships can launch slightly more. Anyway, uh well, I agree that this isn't something they rely on, but it is something that does add to their power. Now, maybe maybe this is necessary because Wargaming found that, hey, DDs are doing really, really well because of they have been buffed here and there quite a bit, so maybe this is to rein them in a little bit as well. So that's a possibility. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we'll see what's going to happen with it. Uh, but I would like to say that Yes, uh, it does make it easier to play as a battleship, but it also means that now you don't really need to make as many decisions about when to use your damage control party because, hey, it was set on fire twice, use damage control party. Hey, uh, uh, you know, hey, I got the single fire, let's use damage control party, and then they don't get punished too much for it. Because what I liked about damage control party is that people would often say like, oh, Arun, why are you using damage control party on a single fire? But that's because I'm not at risk of being torpedoed at the same time. And the chance that they'll set me on fire again isn't very high because I'll be behind an island soon or something like that. And so I like that part of DCP play. And that's going to be mostly gone after this, I think. I guess overall, it's something that I see as just being more new player friendly. And yes, I agree that you're going to lose a, a little bit of more advanced gameplay, but at some point, you know, there, we, we talk about the skill wall, you know, we talk about how once you get to a certain point in the game, you start playing tier seven games to start playing tier eight games, the game changes, you know, the, the, the players get, have a pretty significant step upward in average skill. You, there, there, you know, things become more lethal um, in, in the game just in general, but you have tougher ships to deal with it. You know, so I kind of feel like this is, uh, they're, they're trying to smooth it over a little bit and have more people or have fewer people drop out of the game when they get towards those higher tiers. I think that's not necessarily a bad thing, but on the other hand, um, do we really want that? Because if you keep going down this road over and over, you'll end up in a situation where the game is very, very simple and maybe not as interesting to play. But I suppose that would be a very far away thing to happen. So maybe it's just fine. I agree that that is a danger and and it's something that will have to be kind of thought out and trying to avoid. But you know, for right now, I think that it's okay. But it's definitely something that I, th I think you're right. I think you got to keep an eye on it going forward. So this week, we're going to try out a new segment called Listener Questions of the Week. Uh, I put out the call yesterday on Twitter and Facebook for questions. And next week, I'll try and put it out the request a little bit earlier in the week so that you guys have a little more time to come up with some questions. So, but we'll choose two questions this week and see how it goes. So Yamato's Ghost on Facebook asks... I sometimes have trouble picking the best placement for my battleship. Sometimes I, th I think I see an advantageous spot that covers my flank and allows me to fire on a cap, cover my team's flank, and angle without exposing too much broadside to any one sector, and it ends up falling apart, either because of my placement or my team's actions. What can I do to, po my, to position myself better, or what should I look for specifically when I begin a match as a battleship? Well, I can say, I mean, kind of the biggest thing in it, it's... Regardless of whether you're in a battleship, it, it's really just, you know, any ship and gameplay, you know, in general, the biggest thing to do is to try and, you know, I don't want to say keep your head on swivel, but don't be so locked in and always keep, um, you know, an eye on what's going on in the entire battle. Always trying to keep as much information as possible and just kind of read the battle. If your team, it, in in my opinion, and with, with my play style a lot of times, if, you know, my team is doing really well on one flank, I may go over to the other flank to shore it up. I may read uh, what our team is doing, what the enemy's team is doing, and just kind of respond accordingly. If you need to, 
you know, make that move uh, to maybe intercept another ship or, you know, you've got one side that you notice is, you know, maybe weak or, you know, the enemy is really weak on this side and, and you see maybe more battleships or more targets of opportunity on the other maybe kind of oriented towards that and, and not maybe participating in the steamroll, but, you know, giving, giving yourself, um, you know, a better chance to win as a team. I, and I know that's, that's not necessarily going to help if, if you're trying to increase your damage numbers or your WTR. Um, but honestly, for a player like me, you know, that the W is the only thing that really matters. And I would rather win every game and have no stats than, you know, maybe win a couple games and have, you know, the best stats on the server. So it just, my, my biggest advice would be always don't, don't be so don't get tunnel vision and always keep, you know, an open read of the battle. Try to learn to read the battle, not only your team, but the enemy team as well. And I feel if you can start to read the battle well, then you can just put yourself in the place that you need to be to not only win for your team, but also do damage and and make your stats look good too. I think uh, Vanessa brought up an incredibly important point. This applies to basically any game you play that is player versus player. Always think about what your opponent is going to do. Now, I say always obviously are not always going to be thinking about it, but that's something you want to keep in mind when you are thinking of, why did I fail here? Like, what happened? How could this happen? Uh, You know, why did this go well? Why did this go poorly? If you're trying to answer these kinds of questions, the answer almost always comes from, what was my opponent doing at the same time? And what was my opponent thinking of doing at that time? You know, Think about it. If you were on the enemy team, what would you want to do in that current situation? And then try to, well, estimate what the enemy team is going to do on that side of the map. So, for example, if you only have two two or three ships going on a flank on, let's say, a map like Two Brothers, and the enemy team has four or five, you can be fairly fairly certain that the enemy team is going to start pushing eventually. So you want to position yourself in a way where you can fall back. And you want to make these kinds of... Um, you want to think like this all the time to try to figure out what the best course of action for you is going to be. For example, people often joke about, oh, wow, you should never go through the middle on two brothers and that's this meme strategy. But honestly, it doesn't have to end in a bad way. For example, if you wait for like three, four minutes at the start and nobody actually tries to go through there and none of the enemies come through there, what often ends up happening is that people end up going to the sides of the map and you can simply go through the middle and you won't meet much resistance. You'll run into a few ships, but you can usually deal with those few ships because you catch them off guard. And uh, so going through the middle, for example, isn't always a bad strategy. It just depends on what the enemy team is doing and what they want to do. I guess the thing that I would add is don't underestimate the ability and the power of disengaging in a battleship too often we see people who say i'm going to this side and they when things start to go badly they don't turn around they just go in farther and die so keep in mind that you can turn around uh you know turning around and and fighting a a battle you know fighting a battle over your shoulder as it were you know as you retreat that may be by time for your team to do something else to flank the enemy that's trying to chase you down so particularly when you're in some of the faster battleships at higher tiers don't underestimate the ability of of a fighting withdrawal so our second question comes from vegetable man on twitter who asks if there was one major change or tech tree that you could add to world of warships what would it be and why well if it were a change then i would honestly change dd spotting or CV spotting DDs, uh, but that's this kind of a general answer that we've been talking about a lot recently. Um, tech tree wise, I, I I don't really feel like anything. I ships don't interest me, or I'm not interested in ships in this way in 
World of Warships itself. I'm more interested in what the ships can do. That's a um, that's a good question. I don't know. I I really have to think about it further because um, it's a pretty involving one. Uh, you know, I guess I had an advantage uh, that I didn't <laughs> I didn't give these guys a heads up about what these questions would be, guys. So I actually got a chance to think about it a little bit before the the show. So don't be too hard on these guys. Uh, but honestly, the change that I would make is to look at some of the the ships that I really feel like have gotten left by the wayside. Um, and the one that comes to mind first, honestly, is Bliskavica. Uh, that ship used to be one of the best ships in the game. And through a combination of things that happened around it, no, the Bliskavica was never nerfed directly, but the change to open water stealth firing and some of the other changes that have happened in the game have really turned Bliskavica into a ship that is not really playable anymore. So I, I feel like there are a couple other ships in the game, and I'm sure we can come up with some other examples if we think about it, that the, the game's kind of left by the wayside. And I really feel like these ships need to be adjusted in some way because, you know, you know, for things like that, you know, the premium ship, you paid money for that. I mean, the fact that now that you can't use it, that doesn't feel awesome. I, I, th I thought a little bit more about the question, and uh, I think one, one thing I would like to change is I would like to make ships that were really famous um, better. Uh, maybe buff in terms of strength or maybe make it more comfort comfortable to play or maybe make it, uh, well, just easier to play. I'm not sure what exactly, but I'm talking about ships like uh, Enterprise. Right now, in terms of Tier 8 CVs, it honestly feels like the Saipan is a much superior choice to the Enterprise. But if you look at history, what ship is going to, you know, draw more more people into the game than, well, Enterprise? I don't think there are many ships you can list that would be a higher, you know, higher on that list. And uh, the same would go for, well, for example, Iowa. I think Iowa just is not good enough to well just draw the attention people you know draw the attention of people and uh, i would also like to have some other ships that uh, we still don't have hello akagi vanessa did you uh, come up with anything well uh Aaron and i bought you some time um no because things like this I, I i seriously you know have to give long thought so um maybe i'll if i can get the questions a little sooner i could really you know give it a good good thought Alrighty. Well, uh, that's a good thing for me uh, to note to make sure that I get you guys the questions before the show. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this week. Uh, we There's another quick announcement. We have a new spot on the North American Wargaming forums for just the Warships podcast. So be sure to check that out for news and posts. So we will be posting a little bit differently in there. Uh, both Vanessa and I have moderator powers in there. So we will be able to kind of uh, keep th things that are going on. Uh, do check the link in the podcast description for that. Uh, and then uh, tune in next week because uh, we'll, we'll have another great episode for you. Uh, as always, follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward, uh, forward slash Warships Podcast and Twitter at Warships Podcast for updates between episodes. Don't forget to check out Arun on YouTube and Twitch as well. Did you guys have any quick announcements before we cl close it down for the day? Um, when, when are the episodes going to be on YouTube? Ah, that's a good point, yeah, Arun. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we do. Ha Arun was very kind and was able to figure out a way that we were able to put together episodes uh, onto a video format and then upload them to YouTube. Uh, we do have them created. I and the first, the most recent ten episodes are actually up on uh, YouTube, and this episode will be up on YouTube as well. So you are welcome to uh, check them out there as well. We will be slowly moving the the backlog of episodes up on to YouTube and getting them all set up so that people can listen to those as well. Uh, I did. I have been kind of choosing um, some of our more favorite episodes from our our backlog. Uh, in particular, I, I put up the episode with uh, uh, Admiral Katz uh, that we had, who was the the command uh, the, the second to last commander of the USS New Jersey. So. Do look for on YouTube. Um, we uh, are the uh, the Warships Podcast on YouTube. Look us up, uh, and you can see things that go on there. And we're hoping to get some more content on there as well as things go forward. Uh, so we'll see how that ends up. Uh, but thank you very much, Ruben. I appreciate you uh, you bringing that up. 
We, of course, want to thank our amazing Patreon backers. If you're interested in supporting us, please consider becoming a Patreon backer yourself. Backers are what make the podcast possible, and we literally couldn't make the the show without you guys, so thank you very much. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week.